My name is John Crichton. My name is John Crichton. My name is John Crichton. Look upward and share the wonders I've seen. They start small, they grow, and then they change. I don't know, 26 symbols, it should be easy. <laughs> well, they can barely escape their own gravity. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to episode two of The Skatecast, your guide to the wonders of Farscape. I'm your co-host, Lindy Ray. And I'm Kevin Batchelder. Hey, Lindy, where did the, the lobster quote thing go from John? Well, I think that we're going to change that part of the intro with each skate cast. All right, hey, that's kind of neat. So everyone's got to learn to pay attention at the very beginning of the show. So what's going to be on this episode of the skate cast? Well, on this show we have for you some of our regular features of the trivia and news. And we're going to have a new regular feature on the skate cast where we take a detailed look at each of the Farscape characters. Today as a bonus, we're going to discuss two characters. And we also have a piece on the rules of the Farscape universe. We'll hear our listeners' answers to the question of the week. And all kinds of other cool scapery stuff. There, I got to use the word again. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Kevin. You do a very good job with that word. Right here at the beginning of the Scapecast, we're going to let you know about the spoiler level of the different segments of our show. So when you hear a spoiler level of Season 3, for example, that means that anything that has happened in Season 3 is probably going to be discussed during this Scapecast. So today, our spoiler level is... Season 2. And let's find out how my co-host is doing. Kevin, what's your speed this week? Well, I'm up into Season 3 now, early on, probably five or six episodes into Season 3. So I've got a little more under my belt. Boy, there's a lot going on, and this is really an enjoyable ride, i got to say. Have you found any new characters that you like now? No, I've just, written myself, I'm enjoying seeing some more depth in all the different relationships and such as we're seeing them. Uh, so I'm focusing more on the core players and, and what's happening with all of them and, and enjoying some of the new faces and everything that keep coming in. And that reminds me a little bit kind of what it was like getting our first podcast out a couple of weeks ago and now this one. It's, it's been a, a roller coaster the last couple of weeks. I mean, a lot of fun, but a lot of work getting these things together. So how about things from your side, Lindy? Well, I have just been so excited to be part of this. I've never done anything like this before. To be involved with this great group of people, and we get along great. We're very supportive of each other. It's just so much fun to be together and do this. Right after the first Scapecast was out, within a day, we got all kinds of fabulous feedback from all over the Scaper community. I know that by Saturday evening, that podcast came out on Friday, and by Saturday evening, there was a point, I think, when the whole crew was sitting in front of their computers, just typing furiously on the forums to each other about all the different feedback that we were getting and how exciting it was for everybody. Yeah, I mean, it was great to see some of the different thoughts from folks, you know, some suggestions and, and things of where to improve and, and all kinds of ideas, too. So, I mean, we're, we really look forward to hearing that. We, we're, we're not professionals here, so we're trying to make something that the entire community can enjoy. Feedback and thoughts on all aspects of the show are very important to us, so we really want to make sure folks take the time to do that. It, it helps everybody immensely. And on that vein, I just want to make a small correction. Last week, I said margarita shots and some alert scapers reminded me that it's actually margarita shooters yeah that's where we know the community is going to be right on top of us if we make any mistakes like that and that's not a problem that's part of what we want to make sure we keep ourselves open-minded to so keep those thoughts coming in anytime we're uh, not quite where we should be folks we don't mind hearing about that put on your leather pants and reload your pulse pistol you're listening to the scape cast your guide to the wonders of Farscape. Doggo, you should study this. L M N O P Q. Just a few of their words, just in case. Jenna has already told me a few words. Yes, no, bite me. That's all I need to know. Welcome to Trout Talk, where we learn to speak Farscapes. Today we are going to talk about the Sebastian word frau. Frel is similar to a well-known slang term that, as Claudia Black says, starts with F, ends with uck, and is not fire truck. Can you say the word frel? Say it with me. Frel! Ha 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 The word frel has many different forms and is the most common cuss word in the Farscape universe. What are you so frelling afraid of? Frel, I'm in the wrong band. Frel me dead. You have learned the word frel. 
This is just the beginning of what you need to know. Listen in to our next Scapecast for more Farscapies. For the Scapecast, this is Ema. This girl is slow. Welcome back. Are you ready for your Farscape trivia question? Here we go. I want you to listen to this clip from Farscape. Can you tell me who said this and in what episode? Roger Meaney had no choice. Rock, me, hard choice. Frank, retreat, remain silent, focus, papers, hate disappointment, and expectations. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Forgot to tell you. It was going to be in chipmunk speed. Roger Meaney had no choice. No choice. Rock, me, hard choice. Frank, retreat, remain silent, focus, papers, hate disappointment, and expectations. As always, stay tuned for the answer at the end of the show. For the Scapecast, I'm Brent Barrett. In case you get this show from a friend, you need to go to scapecast.org so you can learn how to download this show for yourself. Yeah, we're now listed in uh, the iTunes directory. So if you're someone who, who uses iTunes or considering a best way to look at getting the show, just by going to there or some of the other podcasting directories, feel free to do that for your own benefit or if you have friends that you know are interested. Our name is all getting added there, so it should be easy enough to find us to be able to get more folks to listen because we all know the more people who are involved with the podcast, just like the fan communities, it just makes our numbers stronger and makes a better chance of us having some impact on seeing some future Farscape content. Hey guys, it's Kenny from California, also known as Farscape Fanatic on the forum. Just wanted to congratulate you guys on your first episode. It was awesome. Keep up the great work. I can't wait for the next one. As we mentioned in the opening of the show, we're going to be doing segments on all the recurring characters from the show. So it seemed only fitting, naturally, that we start out today uh, with our first one, and naturally we'll do it for John Crichton. what is that noise? I'm sorry, Kevin. You have to stop. Um, Brent, Brent, what's going on up there in the sound booth? Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Lindy. Uh, there's this uh, green puppet in here. I know what he's puppet. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, a Hynerian royal. Don't ever forget it. Uh, who has a very small but very nasty looking weapon pointed at my head? Um, he has handed me a note. Uh, he is demanding that his Rigel character review. Uh, be played before John Crichton's. Okay. Sorry I had to shoot you, but you know how it goes. Okay, then. Well, not much choice there. All righty, then. We're going to have to start with Rigel, I guess. We'll do the Rigel segment. This was written by David Walsh, and it's... All about our favorite character, right, Lindy? Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I am a dominar of action. When we first meet Rigel, he has organized an escape from the peacekeepers. With the help of other prisoners, he is making a last desperate bid for freedom. The pint-sized floater is a slimy mystery. Who is he? Where does he come from? Imprisoned and naked, Crichton asks him what is going on. I am Rigel the 16th, dominar to over 600 billion people. I don't need to talk to you. We are to learn that this is a typical response from the Hynerian, yet, for some reason, Rigel does talk for Creighton. So John asks how a dominar has come to be on Moya. Falsely imprisoned. My cousin Bishan stole my throne from me while I slept. A mistake I will soon be correcting. Now, alone in space with five different species, Rigel begins to understand that he must rely on his shipmates, all criminals, for his continued freedom. He begins to fear what the future may have in store for him. Rigel's pompous egotistical arrogance masks his desire for status and attention, which is not helped by the other ways Rigel manages to get noticed. You fart helium? Sometimes. When I'm nervous? Or angry? Hynerians have three stomachs. Naturally, this puts Rigel in a constant state of hunger, thus he is always eating more than his share of food when he's not hoarding it. On the planet Skycar, Rigel discovers an abundance of food and, as might be expected, gorges accordingly. But this food has one unfortunate side effect, flammable piss. You'd think this would be an issue with the crew, but they turn it to their advantage. Rigel to the rescue, pissing dynamite. I've suffered many assassination attempts on Hyneria, but... Nobody knows you here. It's only people who know you who want to kill you. Once the fugitives have made good their initial escape, Rigel comes to realize that the others will not tolerate his horrendous habits or tend to his needs like loyal subjects should. 
he is unsure of his ability to accomplish things for himself, and in true Rigel fashion, he is mortified that he is unprepared for the crisis. I don't know what I'm doing. I've always had others to do for me. Moreover, Rigel tries to bluff his way out of performing tasks which he is not confident that he can accomplish. Given a chance, however, Rigel's contributions show surprising insight and sensitivity. When he is the only one who can remove the paddock beacon from Moya, he's reluctant to injure her. His concern extends even to Zan when she tells him that she will help alleviate Moya's pain by sharing it. This is an awfully big ship. Don't I know it? Later, desperate to impress the Tavlex with his appearance in their negotiations, Rigel's true feelings are revealed to the others. I need them to look up to me. Why? We don't. Well, you should. Since being dethroned, misplaced, and generally mistreated for the last 130 cycles, Rigel craves the rest of the crew's approval. He needs the confirmation that a Dominar would require to rebuild a struggling ego. This is all he really needs, a simple reminder of his birthright, or a swift kick in the ass. On the planet Aquara, when he is mistaken for their deity, instead of accepting the worship of his subjects, Rigel tries to set them straight. No, cease, I command it. I have not risen, I am not a deity. I am but a worthy being like yourselves, but I am your sovereign. Rigel sees himself as their paternalistic guardian, nothing more. Rigel's fragile pride takes another blow when the psychotic peacekeeper Durka boards Moya. Rigel is beside himself at the sight of his former tormentor, and he cannot be dissuaded from his instinctive loathing which has not abated one iota over the cycles. This hatred still burns deep inside of him. It's him! It's Darker! Vicious murdering bastard! Captain of the Zalbinian, the first ship I was imprisoned on. My torturer! Once Durka overcomes his Nabari mental cleansing, he seizes the opportunity to torment the Hynerian once again. It is at this point that Rigel takes a momentous step. Tied up and immobile, instead of cowering in fear, Rigel defies his abuser. Durka, you are pathetic. Look at you, salivating at the chance to maim and kill someone who can't even defend herself, foaming at the mouth like a sick Trelkus. Pathetic. Why, Rigel? What's this? Something I should have said to you a long time ago. Rigel's sudden courage is stunning. When Durka moves towards Eren with the sadistic intention of torturing her, Rigel finds his strength within himself to not only protect a female, the chauvinistic little Hynerian that he is, but also to reclaim his self-respect, overcoming yet another obstacle and realizing his own potency as an individual, not as a ruler. Still, the imperious instincts of a ruler die hard, and Rigel is no exception. He intends to sell out the rest of the crew to Scorpius and Crace in exchange for his freedom. Regaining his throne is more important to him than the lives of the people he has learned to rely upon and respect. Even his protective instincts towards the females aboard Moya are forgotten in his quest to regain his power. You want the Leviathan, the Leviathan gunship offspring, the other escaped prisoners, the defector Eren Sun, and especially you want the one called Crichton. Well, I want my freedom. Interested? Rigel struggles to gain and then regain the respect of his crewmates, and conversely, he has to learn how to treat them as equals and not as his royal subjects. To be their friend flies in the face of everything he was taught as a dominar. At the end of season one, Crichton and Dargo risk their lives to save him as well as the others. Rigel realizes that these mismatched renegades have become family. With time running out, John tells the rest of the crew to starburst to safety, and Rigel is very clear about how he feels in this situation. We cannot leave you and Darker. No. no. We can't, and we won't. Rigel, this is not the time to give up selfishness. Starburst! Rigel has come to realize that his instincts for self-preservation come second to the safety of his friends. He doesn't always do the right thing the first time around. Who does? And this failing can be quite perilous when traversing the uncharted territories. However, Rigel is learning to use his abilities as a leader in ways that he's never considered before. 
the crew has learned to accept him, warts and all. It is now up to Rigel to prove his value to his crewmates, and especially to himself. This is Kurt Armbruster for the Scapecast. Well, Rigel is one pushy dominar. Well, you know, he and Ben Browder have been having this rivalry since their Farscape days. In fact, it's carried over because Ben's doing Stargate SG-1, and they wanted to bring Rigel on as this sassy, straight-shooting alien, except that Rigel wasn't having any part of it unless he got a bigger trailer than Ben, and that just wasn't going to be happening. So it's just like this ongoing feud that the two of them have. Okay, but we'll have to keep our eyes open around here to make sure he doesn't come in and decide to change other things on us. Yeah, he is, uh, like you said, one pushy dominar. I'm Wendy Hembrock, and here's the news. Prepare for immediate starburst. Details on the upcoming Farscape Starburst 4.1 DVD have been released. The DVD contains the first seven episodes of Season 4. Extras include a feature called Farscape The Story So Far, behind-the-scenes interviews with Jonathan Hardy, who voices Rigel, and Rebecca Briggs, who played Commandant Kraza, as well as a feature called Inside Farscape, profiling the series' villains and the Season 4 visual effects. New commentary for the episode John Quixote with Ben Browder and Claudia Black is included. Most of you know Ben wrote this episode. There will also be two listening-in segments with composer Guy Gross covering the episodes Crichton Kicks and John Quixote, plus deleted scenes, updated character histories for Crichton, Aaron, Dargo, and Chiana, a production design gallery, more cool Farscape facts, and a new Alien Encounter segment. The DVD will be available for pre-order on May 16th, and you can find the link in our show notes. Well, here's some news to shake a paddle at. The winning bid in the Waterkeeper Alliance charity auction for lunch with Ben Browder was $10,000. I'd have to rob a shadow depository to pay that tab. The winner gets to eat lunch with Ben on the set of Stargate SG-1. Now that's an expensive lunch, but if Ben's on the menu, it may be worth every dollar. Farscape may not be in any new production, but people are still talking about the show. Episode number 44 of the podcast Treks in Sci-Fi is all about Farscape. And episode 53 of the podcast Sci-Fi Dig has an in-depth review of the Farscape premiere. The links are on our show notes, and you may find listening to them fills the time until the next episode of the Scapecast. In other auction news, the Farscape for Kids group has won a fourth Tubi's Kids auction on the Television Without Pity website. Congratulations to those scapers who've raised over $2,500 thus far for these various recap auctions. All the money goes to children's charities. Keep an eye out for the recap of the Season 2 episode, The Way We Weren't, to hit the pages of Television Without Pity in the near future. Everything begins with family. The Farscape family has lost a crew member. Writer and producer David E. Peckinpah passed away recently of a heart attack at the age of 54 in Vancouver. David wrote two episodes of Farscape, Twice Shy and We're So Screwed Part 1, Fetal Attraction. He was also an executive consultant for the later half of Season 4. You can find a short biography of David's other works in our show notes. Well, Rigel may be nobody's puppet, but he can be your dress-up doll. The plush Dominar Rigel doll is coming in August. Rigel will be the first plush Farscape figure ever. He will stand 13 and a half inches tall, throne sled not included. Check our show notes for the links to pre-order your personal Dominar. Toy Vault, the makers of the Farscape action figures, are also planning to offer a plush Scorpius. Can Peacekeeper Barbie be far behind? Happy birthday to David Franklin on May 7th. David played the recurring role of Lieutenant Bracca. This was an historic day. Congratulations. And now for the convention report. Virginia Hay will be appearing at the Star Trek 40th Anniversary Convention in Las Vegas, August 17th to 20th. Virginia Hay will also appear at Dragon Con on September 1st through the 4th. For a complete list of who's going to be where, check the links on our show notes for the upcoming conventions. 
La La Land Records will release Farscape Classics Volume 2 CD in May. The CD features music for the series composed by Guy Gross. The limited edition CD will have two more complete episode scores. La La Land has previously released two Farscape CDs. Farscape Classics Volume 1 included the soundtracks for Eat Me and Revenging Angel, and the Peacekeeper Wars soundtrack, which was recorded with the Sydney Symphony. The Jim Henson Company will provide exhibits of well-known characters from their groundbreaking films, including The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. The exhibit, titled It's Alive, will feature Aslan, Yoda, T-Rex, and many other icons and aliens representing the work of leading animatronic professionals. The show follows the process from developing characters, conceptual drawings, and workshop construction, as well as video of the finished products. It's Alive opens on Friday, May 12th in Beverly Hills and runs through August 20th. And that's the news. I'm Wendy Hembrock for the Scapecast. You know, Wendy mentioned some of the podcasts that are talking about Farscape, and this week I did listen to the Treks in Sci-Fi podcast about Farscape, where he really strongly recommended Farscape as being one of the best sci-fi shows ever. And I just want to say, Rico, who is the host of the show, we're sending out some scaper love to you. Thanks so much for all the support. Yeah, and the other one this week uh, over at Sci-Fi Dig, a podcast that I listen to regularly, Aaron does some great reviews and other information on Sci-Fi, and he covered uh, the premiere episode there, too. So that was a lot of good stuff, too. It's great to see the Farscape covered in many different areas, and there's some other excellent Sci-Fi podcasts out there for folks who, who are enjoying podcasts in general and want to touch on the different Sci-Fi topics. You are listening to the Scapecast, your guide to the wonders of Farscape. Our next piece is called Establishing the Rules of the Farscape Universe, and it's by Wendy Hembrock. Farscape originated with the vision of Brian Henson and Rockne O'Bannon. They made specific choices that I call the rules of the Farscape universe. If we were playing a game called Farscape, these would be the rules for character behavior. These rules provide the broad parameters for how the stories are told and what stories to tell. We the audience connect to stories based on how true the storytelling feels as a representation of reality without idealization of the characters or the events. The actions and reactions have to resonate with us in some way. There are three rules that frame the Farscape approach to storytelling, and they are all established in the premiere. Your ship, what kind is it? Your ship appeared from nowhere and we don't know that technology. Is it something we can use to escape? We brought you aboard for one reason. <clears throat> Tell us. Or die with us. Yes. Rule number one. In a real universe, we see the full range of emotions and behaviors in response to conflict situations. So keep your ray gun in one pocket and a hanky in the other. The events in Farscape occur in the present, just somewhere else. Nowhere near us that we know. Present day humans have not met any aliens, we think. But we know what we've read in sci-fi novels and watched on TV and films. When Crichton left Earth, there was no alien handbook in the glove box. And when faced with aliens, Crichton did what any 24th century Starfleet officer would do. He tried to communicate. Crichton's stab at the Prime Directive led to a prompt beating and a probe. Zan, Dargo, and Rigel all greet Crichton's arrival differently. Zan goes straight to the point. We grabbed you to help us escape. Dargo goes straight to violence to get a response, and Rigel offers an alliance. Farscape immediately grabs us because communicate is what we expect Crichton to do, and yet he fails. What? In sci-fi, humans are if not welcomed, respected, in charge. Well, they're at least superior. But not here. For these aliens, Crichton is a peacekeeper, the enemy. The real thing about conflict is that people in conflict are not rational. They make decisions based on emotion and self-interest, and that is how life on Moya works. These characters bicker. Even shutting down every non-vital system, it's going to hit optimum plus 15 in six hours. Worse than morons. Find the blockage, clear it. Look, I'll fix the damn problem myself. Stop. We'll search together, tier by tier. 
Pilot, please assist in the narrowing process. On Luxem, this is a mild winter morning. Hmm. Another reason Sebastians hate his world. Emotions and physical needs, and yes, I mean sex, drive the character's behaviors. These aliens do exhibit behaviors that seem human, so we can relate to them, but human only up to a point. They are aliens, aren't they? And there's life out here, Dad. Weird, amazing, psychotic life. And, uh, and technicolor. Rule number two. In a real universe, teeming with life, we are all aliens to somebody. So always rely on the kindness of strange aliens, or the strange alien kindness. The show introduces three characters who are not only alien, but not played by human actors, yet we still relate and care about them all. By the way, what part of the universe are we in? Are we still in Orion's arms, still in the Milky Way? <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> I need to see some star charts, get some common points of reference. Damn, you know, this ship is amazing. What kind of... She's a Leviathan, a biomechanoid, a living ship. Establishing Moya as a living ship was a brilliant and unique choice. Moya is metaphorically like a whale, though obviously her physiology must be quite different. No one can make Moya go anywhere she doesn't want to once she's free of the Peacekeeper control collar. Moya does not speak directly, only through Pilot, so there's a limit to what we can know about her. We don't know what Moya suffered in Peacekeeper captivity, for instance. Even Pilot does not get the full story from Moya about her pregnancy, and Moya nearly kills Pilot along with the rest of the crew when she directs all her resources to the baby. Pilot is symbiotically fused to Moya and is distinct from Moya in character and personality. Pilot is the epitome of the multitasker, but tied to his job. Did Moya make Pilot neurotic as part of being a multitasker, or was he already that way? Maybe the ceaseless demands of the crew and the complex operations of Moya are too much for any being, even one with a three-foot head and four arms. And that is why we like Pilot. He seems in over his head, acting as the receiver of so many commands. In one episode, we are horrified when Zan, Dargo, and Rigel scheme to cut off Pilot's arm to get maps to their homeworld. It didn't actually hurt, it was just a puppet arm, after all. But we are as angry as Creighton on Pilot's behalf, and we are baffled as Creighton when Pilot is seemingly not angry and still willing to serve. This is a reminder that Pilot is not human and truly something different, something alien. And then there is Rigel, a smallish puppet with the ego of a king and the soul of a survivor. Rigel has many negative qualities developed partly from necessity to survive hundreds of cycles. He displays a ruthless pragmatism and highly developed sense of self-preservation to the point of total selfishness. In the season one finale, Family Ties, Rigel tries to sell out the crew to the peacekeepers to save himself and regain his throne. He only returns after realizing that Scorpius is more of a danger than Kreis and his plan will fail. We'd like to think aliens will be happy we found them, but they're not. I have no idea what goes on in that tiny little brain of yours, Dargo. I have no idea why you do anything that you do. Well, catch a clue, pal, because I'm tired of sticking my hand at only to have you snap at it. Every time I let down my guard, you disappoint me. Sorry, I'm only human. You look so much like a peacekeeper, I often forget. And it turns out, the aliens who appear most like us, the peacekeepers, have some of our worst traits. Compassion? What is compassion? Compassion? What? You're kidding, right? It's a feeling that you have when you see someone else's pain and instead of taking advantage of their weakness, you help them. Oh, I know this feeling. Yeah, well, it is a fairly common human feeling. Mm. I hate it. You know what? I'm on the wrong team here. I'm just going to stay. See, these are aliens, even the ones who look like humans. It will take Crichton and us a while to know these aliens. In addition, as with real beings, time matters, and these aliens change based on their experiences. Which brings me to the last rule. Rule number three. In the real universe, nobody knows the story they are living or how it will end. Plans fail, actions have undesirable consequences, and timing is, well, bad. Life is weird. Enjoy the good days and run like hell on the bad ones. Consider how the story begins. 
Crichton is running the most important scientific experiment of his career, then it all goes kaflooey. The first thing that Crichton does in this other galaxy is cause a collision that kills a peacekeeper, Tauvo, Crace's brother. That turns Crace's eye to revenge. When Moya pulls Crichton aboard, his would-be rescuers are in the middle of a prison break and hoping to use him for their own escape. Consider what would have happened to Crichton if he had arrived the day before the escape or the day after. Everyone, aliens included, are on their own journey. The show's creators have wide open spaces to tell stories with character development, like the hero's journey and the human journey of self-discovery. At the start, the aliens have only one common interest, survival. But they have other plans, too. Rigel intends to get his throne back on Hyneria. Xan is seeking spiritual enlightenment as a Delvian priestess. And Dargo wants to find his son. We don't know Moya's plans, but they probably involve her offspring. Aaron is figuring out how to live apart from the peacekeepers and define her own identity. Crichton thinks wormholes will lead him back home to Earth. But plans change because in this universe, pulse pistols cause damage, serious damage. The wounds may heal, they may be forgiven, but they are not forgotten. The actions the characters take have consequences. People get hurt. Talvo, Jelena, and nearly all the crew get hurt somehow in season one. Crichton's plan to save Aaron after she's stabbed succeeds. But his success is not without cost, as he is captured and tortured by Scorpius, whose interrogation method uncovers the secret implanted wormhole knowledge in Crichton. Even Crace gets karmic payback from Aaron when he is subjected to his own go-round in the Aurora chair. I am still your commanding officer. But I am no longer a peacekeeper. You are a peacekeeper for life. On the oath you took. Your oath means nothing to me. You made sure of that. You destroyed everything. I lost everything because of you. Aaron, son. Do you know what I learned while I was away from you? Everything I lost isn't worth a damn. And I don't want to go back to your past. Consider where these characters began in the first episode. Why was Spielberg ever wrong? Close encounters my ass. Wormhole. I must have come here through a wormhole. I must have come here through a wormhole. Yeah. So if I did come here through a wormhole, the only way I'm going to get back is to find another wormhole. Or to create one. Yeah. Right. Ah, oh, look. You want to make one of these wormhole things of yours? How do you expect to do that from inside the cell? Then consider where the characters are at the end of season one. Who would have thought Dargo would volunteer for a suicide mission partnered with Crichton? Or that Aaron, one of the peacekeepers who enslaved Moya, would be trusted by Pilot and Moya enough to name the baby? Or that any of them would be alive? Perhaps you survived for this. This escape. I doubt it will last long enough for the peacekeepers even to note it in their log. Not the escape itself, but what we pray will be the result. Freedom. That is a very... Delvian way to look at the situation. I am nothing if not a product of my upbringing. And I have mine. Then perhaps together a warrior and a priest can help save each other. In the Farscape universe, as in the real one, survival itself is an act of heroism. If we are in a real universe, the writers can ask the big questions. What is the nature of humans? What does it mean to be an alien? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? We see one particular human's journey, and we relate to Crichton's story, although none of us has gone through a wormhole. Crichton represents us, and how we might react if we went across the universe. His story is the human journey, but it's also his unique journey. Crichton does not know the story he's living. He has no plans other than to live another day and maybe get home. His wormhole knowledge may be his salvation or his destruction, but he doesn't know it. Son, I can't help being who I am, who I was. It's not who you are, Dad. I love who you are. It's being son of who you are. <laughs> Look, I can't be your kind of hero. No, you can't be. But each man gets a chance to be his own kind of hero. Your time will come, and when it does, watch out. Chances are it'll be the last thing you ever expected. Because the writers established these rules about realism, Farscape elicits our human reaction to the stories. We're horrified, tickled, disgusted, saddened, thrilled, and hurt along with the crew, 
as the stories unfold. Aliens are unknown to us. Whenever we do encounter alien life, we have no idea what it will be, and we are totally unprepared to deal with it. Maybe someone should get working on some translator microbes. In the meantime, we can always try a Crichton and improvise a bad plan that may help us survive our trip through the wormhole and find our place in the universe. This is John Crichton, somewhere in the universe. I'm Wendy Hembrock for the Scapecast. These are just a few of the segments we've recorded, and you can hear, it isn't what we thought. No, but he'd be a great dirty old man. Damn it, Mal. <laughs> Hand me my teeth. <laughs> no. no, no, we're not, not going to go, go there. There's been no war here, and no podcasting event. The environment is stable. It, It's the signal. The big damn podcast that we added to the iTunes music store, and most of the big podcast directories. It was supposed to entertain the population, feed their craving for Firefly and Serenity. Adventures in Serenity. Well, it works. The people here stopped complaining, and they stopped everything else. www.serenityfirefly.com. They stopped going to work. They stopped breeding, talking, eating. There's twenty thousand people here, and they all just listen to the signal. Captain Reynolds will. I have to be quick. Many of the population had an activist reaction to the signal. Their guerrilla marketing response increased beyond madness. They have become brown coats. Brown coats carry greenbacks, and we want our trilogy. And not just brown coats. They've done things, bought the DVDs. Lent them to their friends. The Firefly Technical Manual. I I won't live to report this, but people have to know. We meant it for the best. To get a sequel made to Serenity. Oh God! The Signal, season two. Serenity is worth fighting for. She gives me a Woody. A Woody. It's a human saying, I've heard you say it often, when you don't trust someone, or they make you nervous, they give you... Willies! She gives you the willies. Our next piece is written by Denise Gideon. Many of you know her as Blue Aaron on the forums. This one is a character study on Bylar Crace. Oh, and Kev, I think we're okay to go ahead with this one because Rigel has left the building. Bylar Crace, captain of a command carrier, was a high-ranking peacekeeper officer with a lot of power. Not often was he thwarted of his goals, and the attempted escape of Moya and her prisoners he took as a personal insult. Crace was not born and bred on a command carrier as most peacekeepers were. He was conscripted as a boy, and to make matters more complicated for him, he had a younger brother serving under his command. Crace's formative years were spent in a farming community where he knew the love of a mother, a father, and a brother. When he was very young, he and his brother were conscripted by the peacekeepers, and the last words his father said to him were, Stay close to Teuvo. Give him guidance. I'm counting on you to protect him. Do you understand? In contrast to Crace's upbringing, peacekeeper children were raised to be free of relationships, to demonstrate loyalty only to their unit, and to not form individual attachments. Defying peacekeeper strictures and keeping his father's words in mind, Crace protected his brother, caring for him, providing guidance, and helping him survive in the harsh peacekeeper environment. While Crace felt the weight of his father's words to look out for his brother, he also felt the pressure to be better than the best. For a long time, Crace successfully maintained a delicate balancing act, advancing within the peacekeeper hierarchy and at the same time remaining true to his father's command. This balancing act, however, was upset beyond all recovery when his brother Tavo was killed. Tavo is dead, struck down by a weak, pathetic, inferior being. It must be avenged! I swear in Tavo's name, Crichton. You will die in my hands. At the moment of Tavo's death, Crace became a failure on all fronts. He was unable in his own eyes to keep his word to his father, and to make matters worse, he broke peacekeeper code by pursuing his own agenda 
by attempting to exact his own brand of personal justice. Peacekeepers believe that they have a mandate to keep control of their section of space. When Kreis ignored that mandate, he set in motion events that would eventually lead to his downfall as a peacekeeper. But the reality was, Kreis never wanted to be a peacekeeper. He was forced into it. He did manage to successfully conform to the society within which he found himself, but the death of his brother sent Kreis careening down a different path, at first blinded by revenge, and then eventually realizing that there was no longer any reason to maintain the appearance of obedience to Peacekeeper High Command. In the final episode of the first season, Kreis struck a deal with Rigel to escape his carrier, the command of which he had lost to Scorpius. This Scorpius fellow, he's obviously the one in power now. <laughs> Be that as it may. Allow me to make a case for my value in these negotiations, your highness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you madman! Do you know what this is? You madman! This is your death certificate, proof you expired. You're early. Come back tomorrow. I am not your reaper. Scorpius is. At that moment, Kreis found the freedom from the peacekeepers for which he had been secretly pining. Talon, Moya's son, provided Kreis a way to escape a life that now had a very limited future. But Talon was more than just a convenient escape to Kreis. He was also a replacement for his younger brother. Mind you, Kreis's theft of Talon was not entirely altruistic, but it was still a relationship that would become a true bond. Kreis rose through the ranks of the peacekeepers because superficially he followed the rules and he was good at what he did. He adopted the strictures of the Peacekeeper Code, but his family ties always held him back from making a complete commitment. Kreis was never a true Peacekeeper. When the agendas of Kreis and the Peacekeepers finally conflicted, his true colors shined through. In the Aurora Chair, when Kreis faced the magnitude of his own actions, he was forced to reevaluate his entire life. I thought it was about my brother. It should have been about my brother. But somewhere along the way, my priorities decayed. I realized I'd become more concerned with my own image and career. It was only when he broke free of the structure that the peacekeepers forced upon him that Kreis began to find the true path that he was meant to follow. For the Scapecast, I'm Brent Barrett. And no, I'm not dead. You're listening to the Scapecast, your guide to the wonders of Farscape. And now we're going to cover our question of the week responses. Got some excellent ones in this week. We appreciate all the feedback, everyone. It's great to hear from you all in any way that works for you. Remember, email or forums or voicemail. We love to hear from you on our question of the week. This week we had, have you ever escaped anyone and how? Piper Chick on the Spacecast forum writes, Howdy, I escaped my younger brothers by making a deal with them. Watch an episode of Farscape and I take them out for ice cream. We never made it out for the ice cream. We watched Farscape till the early morning. They absolutely loved the Peacekeeper Wars, and now they're trying to escape our parents and their friends. For my college friends, it's more of knowing what they like in general and then showing how Farscape meets their criteria. It's either, oh, look at the romance and character relationships between them all, or look at all the gunfighting and butt kicking, or if all else fails, there's a hot guy in leather and a hot girl in leather. That pretty much gets all their attention. Then it's on to the music videos made by the fans. They are such a great tool to use to start getting their appetites wet. I like ice cream myself. A mocha almond fudge is my favorite when I'm watching Farscape. I don't know why, it just is. It was also cool how she took and used a different tactic with, when talking about her older friends and the college crowd being able to understand what everybody likes best. That's a, that's a smart scaper, being able to change their plan based on the audience. Well, scapers are smart just by definition. Mark tells us in an email, my brother was a big Buffy, Angel, and Firefly fan, and he also enjoyed Star Trek The Next Generation, so I figured he would be a good candidate to escape. I sent him tapes of the entire first season, and he was completely unimpressed, thinking it was poorly acted, predictable, uninteresting, and vulgar. And this coming from a guy who has everything imaginable you can buy for Hedwig and the Angry Itch. Oddly enough, he told a female co-worker about the show the next day, and she wanted to see the tapes, to which he complied. She was hooked. I asked my brother if she wanted me to send her the second season, but he said no because she was going to go buy it on DVD. And much to my brother's chagrin, his co-worker ended up escaping five other people in the office. My brother still curses me for having to listen to Farscape talk at the office every day. 
Now the funny thing I like about this one, Lindy, is that even though the first target for the scaping didn't work as intended, it still got through. So again, it just goes to show how you have to keep trying, even if your first attempts don't appear to work the way you expected. Oh, I totally agree with that. And the, you know, I just keep using a bigger and bigger hammer and we see what happens. I do think it was poetic justice though, especially since siblings can sometimes tend to make things harder on purpose that it still ended up happening. I found myself appealing to folks I know loved Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The shows have a similar sensibility that once you've watched a few episodes becomes quite obvious. I think that Farscape appeals to those who are looking to be surprised, amused, challenged, and sometimes just plain old kicked in the gut emotionally. Yet, despite its outer space setting, I wouldn't necessarily recommend Farscape to a sci-fi fan, just as Buffy wouldn't necessarily appeal to a horror fan. The Buffy connection lets someone get it faster than endless explaining does. And if that fails, I just quote the Federation Starship SS butt crack. It can't get any better than that. Sandy M.G. I have to tell you that Buffy is on my summer viewing list. My best friend got the entire series on DVD and she's willing to loan it to me because she's willing to be scaped now. Excellent. That's the best way to do it. You know, when you get folks that know you well enough, you do try to do that when you have to convince them to do it. it oftentimes you got to trade off one show for another, but it's a great way to do it. I've seen that happen a lot. And I must admit, I've not gone more than a few episodes on Buffy, but it is on the definite to-do and to-watch list. Yeah, and actually, I was able to get her to watch Firefly because of Buffy. Everything just kind of leads from one to the next. Jersey Girl on the Scapecast board writes, I modify my tactics depending on how skeptical people are. If they're easygoing, I just kind of take them by the arm, sit them down, pop in a DVD, and say, watch this. Sometimes, though, it takes a little more preparation. When the subject of favorite shows or just sci-fi in general comes up, I'll bring up Farscape. I'll start to talk about the show and then say, but you really need to see it to understand. Eventually, I wear them down. My funniest effort to escape someone was at a company party when my company had just merged with another and we were all meeting one another for the first time. I started talking to a guy from the other group and somehow the subject of sci-fi came up. Keep in mind, we'd all had a bit to drink. Well, I don't know who mentioned it first, but it turned out we were both trying to escape the other one. We were both practically on the floor laughing. Yeah, I just thought that was really funny how they're trying to escape each other. I, I, actually, I don't think I've come across trying to do that yet. That must be a very weird feeling to have that happen. I'm always secretly looking for other escapers. I wear my pins everywhere. These are the pins that Hank makes. We'll talk about that some other time, too. And I'm always waiting for somebody to walk up to me and point to the pin and give me a hug. It hasn't happened yet, though. Well, that's why we keep doing it, hoping for that successful point to come up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not always just looking for a hug, but you know what I mean. Roxy641 posts to our forum. A friend from a sci-fi group asked about Farscape, so I lent him the premiere episode, and I'm looking forward to see what he made of it. I do what I can when I try to escape people. I've lent the willing and interested my DVDs, giving them a disc or two at a time, and they usually come back. <laughs> I showed a friend in another fandom some of my Farscape videos and have offered to send her copies until she can get her own. I try to tell the dubious that it's not just a space show with puppets and attempt to explain the characters and some of the basic storylines. If they're into the angst, I tell them that Farscape is the show for them. The same for romance. The same for humor. I try to sell the show to people based on what I know their likes are. When I'm at work, especially if it's during a shift of CQ or some other detail that takes hours but involves a lot of free time, I'll bring my laptop and just watch episodes trying to get the others there to watch with me. That is how I try to escape people. And I can be a tad relentless. <clears throat> Catherine Bruce. Oh, this sounds like another smart person who comes at it from many different angles depending upon the person they're trying to bring in, which is really the good way to do it. also think it's kind of cool that they've got enough free time to be able to bring in their laptop and watch episodes. I, I wish I had a job like that. 
His Mana girl on the Scapecast board writes, For me, that's easy. I have a DVD player in my car, and on car trips, I bring some of my favorite episodes, and I just put them in. Captive audiences are great. If Meltdown or Out of Their Minds doesn't pique their interest, I don't know what will. I also put some DVDs on when we have friends over as background noise, and every time I do, someone has to peek in and see what it's about. I've lent out my box set so many times, I actually need to write down who has it and when they picked it up. Usually people zip through them, so they're surprised when they find out there were only four seasons. Of course, they're very happy when I hand them Peacekeeper Wars and they find out it's three hours long. Scape the planet. I think that's really great to have the DVD player there in the car, you know, with the iPods and all. Everybody's used to seeing TV shows almost anywhere nowadays. And also that idea of just having it on as background somewhere, you know, just you never know when people's minds are wandering and they're able to pick up the sound of something like that. It can really lead into some great conversations. That's a great way to, quote, always be scaping anytime you've got someone else in the house. Always be scaping. Have you seen Out of Their Minds? You've seen that one already, haven't you? Oh, yeah, the whole body-changing one? Uh, it's, I love that, especially when Crichton just explains that he's a guy and, and how he has to treat Aaron's body when he's in it. Yeah, they, I also read some good stuff in, in one of the books, The Illustrated Companions, about how much fun they all had trying to learn the mannerisms and the physical movements. I mean, that would be a lot of fun trying to make believe you're someone else. Quartermass tells us, Yo-ho! Well, I must admit that of all the sci-fi shows I've seen, this is probably the only one that I admittedly think people should watch. Every year around springtime, I have a mad craving to watch Farscape. A few years back, I was kind of feeling blue, and I remember that Farscape was one of the small things that seemed to brighten my day. Episodes like the Liars, Guns, and Money trilogy, and the one where they bust into the Scarin stronghold just get me pumped. I grew up watching Trek and just about every other sci-fi show, and I did happen to catch the first season of Farscape in Canada on YTV, but I never had the opportunity to check out any other season. When I finally got to see the whole series, it seemed that it had no bounds. Crazy Dren went down all the time. Everything was a gross exaggeration of previous science fiction television shows, and I thought it owned pretty hard. Needless to say, the springtime rolled around again, and I had this wanton desire to consume Farscape again. I pulled out my DVD collection and I checked out the key episodes that I haven't seen for a while. Basically, by this point, I'm so pumped about Farscape that I pretty much need somebody to watch it with. So I'll call up my boys and have them check out some of the deadly sci-fi action. Basically, we'll spend Sunday doing homework, watching sci-fi, and drinking beer, which usually ends up being pretty productive. All in all, I think the best way to get people pumped about Farscape is to just have them over and enjoy it with you. If they're your friends and they don't know about it, just fire up some great episodes and have a good time. That's usually what I do. I have to say this is the only sci-fi that I'll put myself out for. Nothing else seems to deserve it as much. Thanks. Quartermass. Back when the show was new and on regularly, long, long time ago now, I recorded the eps and then edited out the commercials and loaned them to friends. I started with friends who I knew liked sci-fi and got them all hooked almost instantly. Once a DVD started to come out, I began loaning them and the circle of scapers grew around me. Then the cancellation was announced and the fan movement began. I scaped my truck by putting a beautiful Farscape wrap on it. I got several others interested just because of my obvious devotion. Others I met casually at a parking lot or the doctor's office were interested in the art and promised to watch once I told them when it was on. Farscape sells itself, so it was pretty easy. PK girl. Now that is a dedicated person. I mean, I, I definitely will do t-shirts, I've done bumper stickers, but I have never turned my car into a promotional piece. I mean, that kudos on that one. I definitely want to see what that actually looks like. I have seen pictures on some of the forums of people who have turned their Mini Coopers into DRDs. Wow, cool. Cool. I want to see Moya, though. Zelanthia on the Scapecast board writes, I've had the most success with people who are sci-fi fans already. In fact, I don't think any of my sci-fi friends have escaped the Farscape net. I often do it by trading shows. I give them Scape, they give me Star Trek, Buffy Angel, and Stargate. Of course, it's really funny when we're all together and someone says, So, which one is the best? The original airing of the miniseries was great, too. I talked that up for weeks, and even my friend who'd only ever seen the eyes-pulled-out scene from A Clockwork Nabari came out. He managed to catch that scene twice in reruns. We had half scapers, half newbies. By the way, Kevin, I scaped some friends last weekend. When they heard I was working on the scapecast, they actually had to take me seriously. 
I brought the Premier and IET over, but in order to keep them going, Jan wanted to know what the entire four-year story was. She's the mother of six-year-old twins, and it really has to be worth her while if she's going to watch something. So I had to give her the highlights, and I had to tell her how the entire thing was going to work out. So Kevin, you probably want to stick your fingers in your ears and do some singing and not listening to the next part, and I'll tell you when you can start la, again. La, la. La, 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 well, I had la, to tell la, her about la, 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 John la, 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 and how he knows about la, wormholes. I had to tell her that there were more characters coming, like Chiana and Star, and I had to tell her about the babies, but I, I didn't tell her who was going to live or die. I figured she'll have to figure that out for herself. Okay, Kevin, you, you can um, take your fingers out of yours now. Anyway, at the end of our little conversation, she saw that I had a big bag of the DVDs that I was lugging around with me, and she asked me to leave them all at her house so she can finish watching it. So it worked. Hey, that's great. What happened to me this week was just totally by accident. I actually, at work, had to call technical support for our Internet service provider. We were having trouble uh, making a connection, and I actually gave them the website address for the Scapecast, you know, scapecast.org, as an example of what I was having trouble reaching. And as soon as the tech called me back, the first thing out of his mouth was, wow, I love Farscape. I didn't know there was a podcast out there. So that was the perfect way to lead into it that way, and I really got a kick out of that, not even having any intentions that way. On the next episode of the Scapecast, we want you to answer the question, what is your favorite episode from Season 1 or Season 2, and why? Welcome back. You heard the chipmunk speed quote at the beginning of the show. Let's listen to that one more time. What do you mean you have no choice? You're a choice. Rock, me, hard place. Find, retreat, remain silent, focus, dampers, hate, disappointment, triumph. You should lower your expectations. And now let's hear this clip from Look at the Princess at Normal Speed. What do you mean you have no choice? No choice. Rock, me, hard place. Fight, retreat, remain silent. Scorpius, the Empress. He disappoint me, Crichton. You should lower your expectations. Wasn't that fun? See you next week. For the Scapecast, I'm Brent Barrett. Hey everyone, it's Kevin. We again wanted to keep you up to date on all the different ways we can interact with each other. So we want to remind you that we do have that email service so that you can be notified automatically anytime we publish a new show or post an item on our homepage that's of importance to everyone. That's the register for Scapecast updates. You'll see that on most of our web pages. Feel free to just fill in your email address and it'll follow you through in terms of getting on that list so you'll never miss anything that we've got going on. And there are many ways to listen to our show, even if you're new to the podcast world. We put together detailed instructions in the FAQ. If somebody's handed you a CD with this, then you might want to go and check that out to learn about how you can download or listen to the Scapecast yourself. There's this cute little radio thingy in the upper right-hand corner on our homepage of, at scapecast.org, and all you have to do is press the play button, and you'll hear the latest episode of the Scapecast. And remember that a, a show like this really is a community effort. You may hear some familiar voices now that we're into our second show, but it takes a lot of feedback from folks like you, the listeners, and the entire community. I mean, this is your show, so we really do need the feedback. Uh, we appreciate those that have contributed to our questions of the week and such, but take a moment and send us some ideas, you know, show segments you might like to see or answering some of the questions. We very much want to make this a community show, so take the time to let us know what's going on through whatever method you want. We have several ways, but your thoughts and feedback are very important to us. You can email us at feedback at scapecast.org. And, of course, you can also go to the forums where uh, all the other scapers that are registered there. That's starting to grow every day with uh, you folks registering to be able to get feedback on some of these ideas, not only from the whole podcast crew, because we're all registered and contributing there, but the other listeners. So it's a great way to be part of that community, too. The link to the forums is going to be on our website, naturally, at scapecast.org. And remember, that's a .org, not a .com. Finally, we have a voicemail number so you can leave us comment or answer to our question of the week. That phone number is 206-350-MOYA, which is 206-350-6692. If you can record a comment on your own, just email it to us using an MP3 or a WAV file. Thanks again for joining us as we continue our journey. I'm Lindy Ray. And I'm Kevin Batchelder. Now it's time to disable your comms and find new wonders. Until next time. This is John Crichton, somewhere in the universe. You've been listening to Episode 2 of The Scapecast, produced May of 2006. Writers for this episode were Lindy Ray, Kevin Batchelder, Nicola Wood, Brent Barrett, 
Kurt Armbruster, David Walls, Wendy Hembrock, and Denise Gideon. This episode featured voice performances by Lindy Ray, Kevin Batchel, Wendy Hembrock, Kimberly Thompson, Brent Barrett, Kurt Armbruster, Nicola Wood. This scapecast has been brought to you by the word frail. <laughs> I'm getting into the subliminable stuff almost. Let me try the getting it. Only this time we get the word right. Subliminable? I think that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're going to ditch this one entirely. And let's come back to the beginning. Okay. In three. Shh, you're not helping. In three, two, one. For the entire Escape Cast crew, I'm Brent Barrett. Thank you for listening and fly safe. <laughs>